Dear friends in Christ, on this most holy night in which our Lord Jesus Christ passed from death to life, the Church invites her members dispersed throughout the world to gather in vigil and in prayer. For this is the Passover of the Lamb and the Lord, by which, by hearing His word and celebrating His sacraments, we share in His victory over death. Let us pray. O oh God, through your Son you have bestowed upon your people the brightness of your light. Sanctify this fire and grant that in this Paschal feast we may so burn with heavenly desires that with pure minds we may attain to the festival of everlasting light through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Christ, yesterday and today, the beginning and the end, the Alpha and the Omega, His are the times and the ages. Through this, his holy and glorious wounds, may Christ guard and preserve us. May the light of Christ gloriously rising dispel the darkness of our hearts and our minds.
Rejoice, well, heavenly hosts and choirs of angels, and let your trumpets shout salvation for the victory of our mighty in radiant light, resound with the praises of your people. For you who stand near this marvelous and holy flame, pray with me to God the Almighty for the grace to sing the worthy praise of this great light. Through Jesus Christ, his Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with him in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen.
living sacrifice, the offering of this candle in your honor, may it shine continually to drive away all darkness. May Christ, the morning star who knows no setting, find it Genesis first, uh, chapter 1. In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was a formless void and darkness covered the face of the deep, while a wind from God swept over the face of the waters. In the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens, when no plant of the field was yet in the earth, and no herb of the field had yet sprung up, for the Lord God had not caused it to rain upon the earth. There was no one to till the ground, but a stream would rise from the earth and water the whole face of the ground. Then God said, Let there be light. And there was light. And God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning, the first day. And God said, let there be a dome in the midst of the waters, and let it separate the waters from the waters. So God made the dome and separated the waters that were under the dome from the waters that were above the dome, and it was so. God called the dome sky, and there was evening, and there was morning, the second day. And God said, let the waters under the sky be gathered together into one place, and let the dry land appear, and it was so. God called the dry land earth, and the waters that were gathered together he called seas. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let the earth put forth vegetation, plants yielding seeds and fruit trees of every kind on earth that bear fruit with the seed in it. And it was so. The earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seeds of every kind and trees of every kind bearing fruit with the seed in it. And God saw it and it was good. And there was the evening and there was the morning, the third day. And God said, let there be lights in the dome of the sky to separate the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. And let them be lights in the dome of the sky to give light upon the earth. And it was so. God made the two great lights, the greatest light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night and the stars. God set them in the dome of the sky to give light upon the earth, to rule over the day and over the night, and to separate the night from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was morning, the fourth day. And God said, let the waters bring forth swarms of living creatures, and let birds fly above the earth across the dome of the sky. So God created the great sea monsters and every living creature that moves of every kind 
with, with which the waters swarm, and every winged bird and every kind. And God saw that it was good. God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill waters in the seas, and let birds multiply in the earth. And there was evening, and there was morning, the fifth day. And God said, Let the earth bring forth living creatures of every kind, cattle and creeping things and wild animals of the earth of every kind. And it was so. God made the wild animals of the earth of every kind, and the cattle of every kind, and everything that creeps upon the ground of every kind. And God saw that it was good. Then the Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground and breathed his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. And the Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east, and there he put the man whom he had formed. Out of the ground the Lord God made to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food the tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Then God said, Let us make humankind in our image. According to our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the wild animals of the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on, on the earth. So God created humankind in his image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth and subdue it, and have, have dominion, dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. God said, See, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is upon the face of all the earth, and every tree with the seed and its fruit, you shall have them for food. And to every beast on the earth, and every bird in the air, and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has the breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. God saw everything that he had made, and indeed, it was very good, and there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. Thus the heaven and the earth were finished, and all the multitude. And on the seventh day, God finished the work that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all the work that he had done. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to till it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, You may freely eat of every tree of the garden, but the tree of the knowledge and go of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall die. Then the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper as his partner. So out of the ground the Lord God formed every animal of the field, and every bird of the air, and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all cattle, and to the birds of the air, and to every animal of the field. But for the man there was not found a helper as his partner. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and he slept. Then he took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, this at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. This one shall be called woman, for out of a man this one was taken.
for centuries, the people of God have wondered which one of these stories of creation is right. Was the world and all that is in it created in seven days? Or is it right that all life emerged from the garden? Some argued for the seven days. It was so expansive, surely it'd be right. Others argued for the garden. Tell tell the story. It must be right. On and on it went. Until finally one scholar, ancient of days, stood up and with weariness in his voice said, Enough! They're both right. Please rise. Let us pray. O God, who wonderfully created and yet more wonderfully restored the dignity of human nature, grant that we may share the divine life of him who humbled himself to share our humanity, your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. these things, God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham. And he said, here I am. He said, take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains that I shall show you. So Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, and took his two of his young men with him and his son Isaac. He cut the wood for the burnt offering and set out and went to the place in the distance that God had shown him. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place far away. Then Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with the donkey, 
the boy and I will go over there. We will worship, and then we will come back to you. Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on his son Isaac, and he himself carried the fire and the knife. So the two of them walked together. Isaac said to his father, Abraham, Father, and he said, Here I am, my son. He said, The fire and the wood are here. But where is the lamb for a burnt offering? Abraham said, God himself will provide the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. So the two of them walked on together. When they came to the place that God had shown him, Abraham built an altar there and laid the wood in order. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife to kill his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here I am. He said, do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. And Abraham looked up and saw a ram caught in a thicket by its horns. Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called that place, the Lord will provide, as it is said to this day, On the mount of the Lord it shall be provided. The angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time from heaven and said, By myself I have sworn, says the Lord, because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will indeed bless you, and I will make your offspring as numerous as the stars of heaven and as the sand on it that is on the seashore. And your, offering shall, and your offspring shall possess the gate of their enemies. And by your offspring shall all the nations of the earth gain blessing for themselves, because you have obeyed my voice." shows no doubt, no fear. But we who hear the story, we have questions. Questions that even if Abraham did not ask, would arise on the road to Moriah. Perhaps from an old man that Abraham meets on the road. Where are you going? And Abraham replies, to pray. And do you typically pray carrying fire and a knife and and wood sorry and wood on your shoulders? We may tarry there for several days. We may need to slaughter an animal and cook it. Maybe. Or maybe the Holy One ordered you to sacrifice your son. Let me ask you this have you lost your mind? You've waited 100 years to beget a son, and now you're going to destroy him? I get it. I do. You trust in the Holy One, and you want to prove your faith. That's admirable. So you'll do it. You will sacrifice Isaac. But what if tomorrow, after you've done it, the Holy One says, What have you done? You have taken a life. You've taken a precious gift that I gave you. Abraham. Do you know what happened to the man who destroyed everything he had? I'll tell you, he was miserable. He had to beg from others. If you destroy a soul, you will be held accountable. 
And Abraham replies, I'm still going to do it. And the old man says, so you think. But the Holy One won't let it happen. He'll put an animal in the bushes at the last minute. He'll change his instructions. You have to believe that. I can't listen to you, even if I'm right. That's the thing about a liar. Even when he tells the truth, no one will believe him. Please rise. Let us pray. God and Father of all believers, for the glory of your name multiply by the grace of the Paschal Sacrament the number of your children, that your church may rejoice to see fulfilled your promise to our father Abraham through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. As Pharaoh drew near, the Israelites looked back, and there were the Egyptians advancing on them. In great fear, the Israelites cried out to the Lord. They said to Moses, was it because there were no graves in Egypt that you have taken us away to die in the wilderness? What have you done to us, bringing us out of Egypt? Is this not the very thing we told you in Egypt? 
let us alone and let us serve the Egyptians. For it would have been better for us to have served the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. But Mo Moses said to the people, do not be afraid. Stand firm and see the deliverance that the Lord will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall never see again. The Lord will fight for you, and you have only to keep still. Then the Lord said to Moses, Why do you cry out to me? Tell the Israelites to go forward. But you lift up your staff, stretch out your hand over the sea, and divide it. That the, Israelites, that the Israelites go into the sea on dry ground. Then I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians so that they will go in after them. And so I will gain glory for myself over Pharaoh and all his army, his chariots, and his chariot drivers. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I have gained glory myself, for myself over Pharaoh, his chariots, and his chariot drivers. The angel of God for the Israelite army moved and went behind them, and the pillar of cloud moved from in front of them and took its place behind them. It came between the army of Egypt and the army of Israel. And so the cloud was there with the darkness, and it lit up the night. One did not come near the other all night. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea. The Lord drove back the sea by a strong east wind all night and turned the sea into dry land. And the waters were divided. The Israelites went into the sea on dry ground, the waters forming a wall for them on their right and on their left. The Egyptians pursued and went into the sea after them all of Pharaoh's horses, chariots, and chariot drivers. At the morning watch, the Lord in the pillar of fire and cloud looked down upon the Egyptian army and threw them into a panic. He clogged their chariot wheels so that they turned with difficulty. The Egyptians said, let us flee from the Israelites for the Lord is fighting for them. Then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand over the sea so that the water may come back, back upon the Egyptians, upon their chariots and their chariot drivers. So Moses stretched out his hand over the sea and at dawn the sea returned to its normal depth. As the Egyptians fled before it, the Lord tossed the Egyptians into the sea. The waters returned and covered the chariots and the chariot drivers the entire army of Pharaoh that had followed them into the sea, not one of them had remained. But the Israelites walked on dry ground through the sea, the waters forming a wall for them on their right and on their left. Thus the Lord saved Israel that day from the Egyptians, and Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. Israel saw the great work that the Lord did against the Egyptians. So the people feared the Lord and believed in the Lord and his servant Moses. Then Moses and the Israelites sang this, this song to the Lord. I will sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. Horse and rider he has thrown into the sea. to the birds that lived along the shoreline. The sudden arrival of all these people and the song of the women, the rattle of their instruments, the exuberant dancing, this must have seemed like pandemonium. But 
The angels in heaven, too, were watching. And they, too, had never seen such a song of praise. Not from Adam, nor Abraham, not from Adam. This exquisite song of praise. The angels wanted to join in to celebrate with the Israelites. But the Lord said to the angels, do not sing today. How can you sing when the works of my hands are drowning in the sea? Let us pray. O merciful God, save all whom oppression drowns, wash away injustice. With Miriam we sing to the majestic mercy of your baptismal waters. O merciful God, we implore you, 
This time save also the Egyptians. In your mercy wider and deeper than all the oceans of the earth. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land, and a certain man of Bethlehem in Judah went to live in the country of Moab, he and his wife and two sons. The name of the man was Elamelech, and the name of his wife, Naomi. But Elamelech, the son of Naomi, died, and she was left with her two sons. These took Moabite wives, the name of one was Orpah, and the name of the other, Ruth. When they had lived there about ten years, both Malone and Killian also died, so that the woman was left without her two sons and her husband. Then she started to return with her daughters-in-law from the country of Moab, for she had heard in the country of Moab that the Lord had considered his people and had given them food. So she set out from the place where she had been living, she and her two daughters-in-law, and they went on their way back to the land of Judah. But Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go back, each of you, to your mother's house. May the Lord deal kindly with you, as you have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant that you may find security, each of you, in your house of your husband. Then she kissed them, and they wept aloud. They said to her, No, we will return with you to your people. But Naomi said, Turn back, my daughters. Why will you go with me? They wept aloud again. Orpah kissed her mother-in-law goodbye, but Ruth clung to her. So she said, Look, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, do not press me to leave you, to turn back from following you. Where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, and there will I be buried. May the Lord do thus to me, and more as well, if even death parts me from you. When Naomi saw that she was determined to go with her, she said no more to her. <clears throat> so Naomi returned together with Ruth the Moabite, her daughter-in-law, who came back with her from the country of Moab. They came to Bethlehem at the beginning of the barley harvest. Now Naomi had a kinsman on her husband's side, a prominent rich man of the family of Elamelech, whose name was Boaz. And Ruth the Moabite said to Naomi, Let me go to the field and glean among the ears of grain behind someone who, in whose sight I may find favor. She said to her, Go, my daughter. So she went. She came and gleaned in the field behind the reapers. As it happened, she came to the part of the field belonging to Boaz, who was the family of Elamelech. Then Boaz said to his young man who was in charge of the reapers, To whom does this young woman belong? The young man who was in charge of the reapers answered, She is the young Moabite woman who came back with Naomi from the country of Moab. She said, Please, let me glean and gather among the sheaves behind the reapers. 
So she came and she has been on her feet from early this morning until now without resting even for a moment. Then Boaz said to Ruth, now listen, my daughter, do not go to glean in another field or leave this one, but keep close to my young women. Keep your eyes on the field that is being reaped and follow behind them. I have ordered the young men not to bother you. If you get thirsty, go to the vessels and drink from where the young men have drawn. Then she fell prostrate with her face to the ground and said to him, Why have I found favor in your sight that you should take notice of me when I am a foreigner? But Boaz answered her, All that you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband has been fully told to me, how you left your father and mother in your native land and came to a people that you did not know before. May the Lord reward you for your deeds, and may you have a full reward from the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come for refuge. Her mother-in-law said to her, Where did you glean today, and where have you worked? Blessed be the man who took notice of you. She told her mother-in-law with whom she had worked, saying, The name of the man with whom I work today is Boaz. Then Naomi said to her daughter-in-law, Blessed be he by the Lord, whose kindness has not forsaken the living or the dead. Naomi also said to her, The man is a relative of ours, one of our nearest kin. Naomi, her mother-in-law, said to her, My daughter, I need to seek some security for you, so that it may be well with you. Now here is our kinsman Boaz, with whose young women you have been working. See, he is winnowing barley tonight at the threshing floor. Now wash and anoint yourself and put on your best clothes and go down to the threshing floor, but do not make yourself known to the man until he has finished eating and drinking. And when he lies down, observe the place where he lies. Then go and uncover his feet and lie down, and he will tell you what to do. She said to her, All that you say, I will do. So she came down to the threshing floor and did just as her mother-in-law had instructed her. At midnight, the man was startled and turned over, and there, lying at his feet, was a woman. He said, Who are you? And she answered, I am Ruth, your servant. Spread your cloak over your servant, for you are next of kin. He said, May you be blessed by the Lord, my daughter. This last instance of your loyalty is better than the first. You have not gone after young men, whether rich or poor. And now, my daughter, do not be afraid. I will do for you all that you ask. And for all the assembly of my people, know that you are a worthy woman. Later, Boaz said to the elders and all the people, You are witnesses today that I have acquired from the hand of Naomi all that belonged to Elamelech and all that belonged to Kilian and Malin. I have also acquired Ruth the Moabite, the wife of Malin, to be my wife, to maintain the dead man's name on his inheritance, in order that the name of the dead may not be cut off from the kindred and from the gate of his native place. Today you are my witnesses. Then all the people who were at the gate, along with the elders, said, we are witnesses. May the Lord make the woman who is coming into your house like Rachel and Leah, who together built up the house of Israel. May you produce children and Ephrathath and, maybe, and bestow a name in Bethlehem. And through the children that the Lord will give you by this young woman, may your house be just like the house of Perez, whom Tamar bore to Judah. So Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife. When they came together, the Lord made her conceive 
and she bore a son. The women of the neighborhood gave him a name, saying, A son has been born to Naomi. They named him Obed, and he became the father of Jesse, the father of David. Moving in by Audre Lorde. It is the worst of luck to bring into a new house from the old bread, salt, or broomstick. Salt, bread, and broom, be still. I leave you guardian against gone places. I have loved your loss in a green promise making new salt, bread, and broom. Remove me from the was I still am to now be coming. Hear this house, forever blessed. Let us pray. God of our mothers, you bless us even in lean times and bring us to times of plenty. Be with us as we cling to one another through the changes and chances of life. In the name of the one who never turns back from us.
seized Darius to set over the kingdom 120 satraps stationed throughout the whole kingdom, and over them three administrators, one of whom was Daniel. To these the satraps gave account, so that the king might suffer no loss. Soon Daniel distinguished himself above the other administrators and satraps because an excellent spirit was in him, and the king planned to appoint him over the whole kingdom. So the administrators and the satraps tried to find grounds for complaint against Daniel in connection with the kingdom, but they could find no grounds for complaint or any corruption because he was faithful and no negligence or corruption could be found in him. The men said, we shall not find any ground for complaint against this Daniel unless we find it in connection with the law of his God. So the administrators and satraps conspired and came to the king and said to him, O King Darius, live forever. All the administrators of the kingdom, the prefects and the satraps, the counselors and the governors are agreed that the king should establish an ordinance and enforce an interdict that whoever prays to any god or human for 30 days, except to you, O king, shall be thrown into the den of lions. Now, O king, establish the interdict and sign the document so that it cannot be changed according to the law of Medes and the Persians, which cannot be revoked. Therefore, King Darius signed the document and interdict. Although Daniel knew that the document had been signed, he continued to go to his house, which had windows in its upper room towards Jerusalem, and to get down on his knees three times a day to pray to his God and praise him, just as he had done previously. Then those men watched and found Daniel praying, seeking mercy before his God. Then they approached the king and said concerning the interdict, O king, did you not sign an interdict that anyone who prays to any god or human within 30 days except to you, O king, shall be thrown into the den of lions? The king answered, The thing stands fast according to the law of Medes and Persians, which cannot be revoked. Then they responded to the king, Daniel, one of the exiles from Judah, pays no attention to you, O king, or to the interdict you have signed, but he is saying his prayers three times a day. When the king heard the ch charge, he was very much distressed. He was determined to save Daniel, and until the sun went down, he made every effort to rescue him. Then the conspirators came to the king and said to him, No, O king, that is a law of Medes and Persians that no interdict or ordinances that the king establishes can be changed. Then the king gave the command, and Daniel was was brought and thrown into the den of lions. The king said to Daniel, May your God, whom you faithfully serve, deliver you. A stone was brought and laid on the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet ring and with the signet ring of the Lord, so that nothing might be changed concerning Daniel. Then the king went to this palace and spent the night fasting. No entertainment was brought to him, and sleep fled from him. Then at dawn, the king got up and at first light hurried to the den of lions. When he came near to the den where Daniel was, he cried out anxiously to Daniel, O oh Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you faithfully serve, been able to deliver you from the lions? Daniel then said to the king, O oh king, live forever. May God sent, my God sent his angel and shut the lion's mouth so that it would not hurt me because I was found blameless before you, also blameless before him, also before you. O king, I have done no wrong. Then the king was exceedingly glad and commanded that Daniel be taken up out of the den. So Daniel was taken up out of the den and no kind of harm was found on him because he had not he had trusted in his god 
The king gave a command, and those who had maliciously accused Daniel were brought and thrown into the den of lions, they, their children, and their wives. Before they reached the bottom of the den, the lions overpowered them and broke all of their bones in pieces. You may write me down in history with your bitter, twisted lies. You may trod me in the very dirt, but still, like dust, I'll rise. Does my sassiness upset you? Why are you beset with gloom? Because I walk like I've got oil wells pumping in my living room. Just like moons and like suns, with the certainty of tides, just like hopes springing high, still I'll rise. Did you want to see me broken, bowed head and lowered eyes, shoulders falling down like teardrops, weakened by my soulful cries? Does my haughtiness offend you? Don't you take it awful hard because I laugh like I've got gold mines digging in my own backyard? You may shoot me with your words. You may cut me with your eyes. You may kill me with your hatefulness, but still, like air, I'll rise. Does my sexiness upset you? Does it come as a surprise that I dance like I've got diamonds at the meeting of my thighs. Out of the huts of history's shame I rise. Up from a past that's rooted in pain I rise. I'm a black ocean, leaping and wide, welling and swelling, I bear in the tide. Leaving behind nights of terror and fear I rise. Into a daybreak that's wondrously clear I rise, bringing the gifts that my ancestors gave. I am the dream and the hope of the slave. I rise, I rise, I rise.
Let us pray. Blessed are you, Lord, God of our salvation. Your servant Daniel was devoted to you, even when faced with the threat of death by his enemies. As your angels kept shut the jaws of death, protect your people as we try to be faithful today, and stir in us a trust in your unfailing love. O Lord, our Maker and Redeemer. Through the Paschal Mystery, dear friends, we are buried with Christ by baptism into his death and raised with him to newness of life. I call upon you, therefore, now that our Lenten observance is ended, to renew the solemn promises and vows of holy baptism, by which we renounced Satan and all his works and promised to serve God faithfully in his holy Catholic Church. Do you affirm your renunciation of evil and renew your commitment to Jesus Christ? Do you believe in God the Father? Do you believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God? I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, and died in the third. He ascended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. Do you believe in God the Holy Spirit? Will you continue in the apostles' teaching and fellowship, in the breaking of the bread, and in the prayers? Will you persevere in resisting evil, and whenever you fall into sin, repent and return to the Lord? Will you proclaim by word and example the good news of God in Christ? Will you seek and serve Christ in all persons, loving your neighbor as yourself. Will you strive for justice and peace among all people and respect the dignity of every human being.
Okay, and yeah, battery. What? Yep, looks good. What happened? What's that? Well, the, the came up and said battery.
and Richard Theodore Eli, Philip the Evangelist, Charlie Moore Williams, and Ignatius of Antioch. to an innumerable company of angels and to the spirits of the just made perfect in you. Grant us during our earthly pilgrimage to abide in their fellowship and in our heavenly country to become partakers of their joy. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Hallelujah! 
Christ is risen. Christ is risen God be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. O God, who made this holy night to shine with the glory of the Lord's resurrection, stir up in your church that spirit of adoption which is given to us in baptism that we, being renewed both in body and mind, may worship you in sincerity and truth. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns forever with you, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever.
Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Then Peter and the other disciple set out and went toward the tomb. The two were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent down to look in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb. He saw the linen wrappings lying there, and the cloth that had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple, who reached the tomb first, also went in, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture, that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples returned to their homes. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb, As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white, sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head and the other at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. When she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you looking for? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabuni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not hold on to me, because I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. The Gospel of the Lord. Here we are. (laughs) We made it. Out of the cold and the dark, we have come to a place of warmth and light and gold. Alleluia. Christ is risen. Tonight of all nights, this truth is pure and palpable and living. 
We've just witnessed the miracle of something transformed into its opposite. Like a flame in the dark, like sound out of silence, life has birthed forth from death. Part of me thinks a sermon has nothing to add to this moment. The liturgy speaks for itself. There's a reason we use fire and water and the darkness of night to enact our Easter vigil. These forces are elemental, deeper and more powerful than language. What we've just experienced with our senses is irreducible and complete. But here we are at the part of the liturgy where there's supposed to be a sermon. (laughs) A time for us to reflect together for a moment on what we've experienced and what it all means. And since we're here, I do have something simple I want to try to tell you. I want to share how I've experienced this Holy Week at All Souls. This is my first Holy Week with all of you, and I've felt moving in and among us something that I've never experienced before. What I've felt has been personal, but also collective, intimate, and also shared. What I've glimpsed, I think, is what happens when hundreds of strands of individual experience meet one another with common vision and purpose, when we share in a common belief and act from a common hope. When that happens, something new emerges, something that has changed my understanding of the promise of the resurrection and what we're rejoicing in tonight. I'll do my best to try to describe it because I think And I hope that you have felt it too. I want to start with tonight's gospel, the resurrection account according to John. The way that John tells this story is particular, and it's helped me make sense of the ways we participate, individually and together, in the truth of this resurrection story. In John's telling, we first see disciples racing to the tomb and finding the empty linen wrappings. And then we see Mary Magdalene weeping in the garden and then encountering the risen Christ. Throughout the passage, John's choices of structure and grammar give us clues about how he wants us to enter the story, where we're meant to train our gaze. The passage is dramatic and moving, but it's not suspenseful, at least not in the way we might expect. From the very beginning, the resurrection itself is never in question. This text doesn't prompt us to ask whether Jesus is risen. Instead, John takes pains to ensure that we, the readers, know that Jesus has risen far before the characters do. Look at the careful way that verses 13 and 14 are worded. Mary sees two angels, but she doesn't immediately assume that Jesus is risen. Why would she? So she asks the angels where they've laid his body. And when she, Mary, had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, But she did not know that it was Jesus. And Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? The structure of these sentences is very deliberate. We're told that Jesus is standing there, and then we're told a clause later that Mary doesn't know it. Before he opens his mouth, we're told that it's Jesus who's speaking, but Mary spends another sentence thinking this man is the gardener. The narrative pull in this passage is not our own dawning recognition of Jesus. 
It's our waiting to see if Mary will recognize Jesus and how she will respond. In other words, the resurrection of Jesus the Christ, according to John, has at least two key dimensions. There's the event of Jesus' rising from the dead. And then there's the recognition of that event by those who witness and follow. John is careful to show that Christ is risen far before Mary or the disciples realize it. The resurrection doesn't depend on whether or not we, humans, recognize and believe. And at the same time, the resurrection doesn't exist out there, abstract and disembodied. Mary, says Jesus, rooting us in time and space, calling her by name. The resurrection comes alive when we receive it as the truth and when we recognize that we are part of this great story. And that account feels right to me. I think about the moments in my own life when the resurrection has felt most real and urgent, when I depended on the hope, however faint, that life really does overcome death. These moments are deeply personal and particular. There have been times when ongoing illness has left me empty and unwilling to keep fighting. I've stopped believing that I'll ever be free or whole again. There are times when shame and pain have been so great in me that I've assumed I'm beyond rescue, so I've stopped seeking help or love. I imagine we've all been there, to those places of inner darkness where all faith and hope and desire and will are gone. And each time, without fail, something in me refuses to stop living, refuses to stop seeking hope and light. I don't usually want to, I don't believe it's possible or worth it, yet somehow I do choose life again. In these moments, I never think consciously about the resurrection. But somewhere deep in the cells of my body and the recesses of my imagination, I think I do carry this story. And it matters, in hindsight, to call those moments small resurrections. In doing so, I place my particular suffering within a story in which all suffering even suffering unto death, is transformed. These experiences, these resurrections, have been profound and life-changing. They're why I became a priest. They're what I bring when I kneel at the cross on Good Friday. They make the grief and absence and waiting of Holy Week feel real. But these small resurrections have been mostly solitary. I go off, I have the experience of suffering and transformation, and then later, once it's over, I make the connection between what we do and say in church and what I have felt in me. This week, that boundary dissolved completely. Day after day, I experienced the union of belief and action, the meeting of my story and the stories of other people, of you. I felt the hopes and fears I carry inside me come alive outside me, where they can be seen, shared, and maybe transformed. On Maundy Thursday, we stripped the altar bare and watched the flame die in the last candle. With me that night was the pain of every time my inner light has gone out. 
But all night in the chapel, people from our community watched and waited. We took turns tending the flame in the long hours before dawn. On Good Friday, we heard reflections from people in our congregation. They told personal stories of guilt and fear and stumbling as we made our way through the stations of the cross. In their vulnerability, I felt myself met in my own tender, unseen places. Being human can connect us rather than driving us apart. And this evening, at the start of our liturgy, we chanted, Within our darkest night, you kindle the fire that never dies away. As our voices mingled, we filled the night with the radiance and the beauty that we long for. Together, our faith that the light can emerge made it so. This is what we do for each other. This is why we come to this place called church. I can't count the number of times this week that I've marveled, other people actually believe all this. <laughs> and I can't count the number of times I've wept with joy and astonishment and relief because of that. I wept because this Holy Week, I finally realized I will never again be alone in my darkness. We never are alone. That is the promise of the resurrection. That is what we celebrate and rejoice in this vigil night. Christ's living and dying and rising ensured that there is no extreme of suffering where God is not present. God is with us even unto death. And Christ's living and dying and rising knits us together as one body. Christ's body. That body receives our shame, our aloneness, our fear, our suffering, and bears these things for us so that we can keep hope and begin again. And so, whether you've joined us for every Holy Week service, or whether you're here just for this evening, whether you believe in the story our Gospels attest to, or whether you're drawn here to question and explore, Tonight, the truth of the risen Christ lives in and among us, and it is strong and full and good. So let's savor it together, and let's rejoice.
Most holy God, we are grateful for this night, for all that has brought us here, for all that we hold on our hearts, for the people, the places in need of your care, and for the trust we have in you, your resurrection, and your life. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Alleluia. Alleluia. And may the peace of the risen Christ be always with you. Am I supposed to do something now? Um, hello, uh, Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Alleluia. So that was something. Uh, welcome to all souls and to the Easter vigil. Um, and uh, the, the feast that will begin at this table in a few moments will continue. And so we invite you to join us next door, through this door, or through the courtyard that you were just in, into the parish hall for uh, a feast that will continue for as long as it needs to. Um, just one uh, word about this feast here, which is that we have a belief at all souls that all who are drawn to Christ are welcome at this table. Uh, especially on a night like this when we celebrate the first, uh, the first Eucharist of the Resurrection this Easter night. So please come and join us here. Um, you'll find uh, bread that you can uh, reach your hand out like this for. Uh, you'll find uh, wine in a particularly bubbly form tonight. Um, and uh, on this pillar here, you'll also find um, uh, alcohol-free wine. So it's grape juice with body. Um, and, uh, and so uh, we invite you to come forward. And if you would just like to come forward tonight to receive a blessing, um, we are uh, glad to offer God's blessing upon you. Uh, lastly, just a word of thanks. It takes so many people uh, to create a holy week, a triduum, a night like this. Uh, all the people who uh, read, all the people who sang, all the people who ushed. Um, <laughs> Our acolytes, uh, uh, let's see, our arts folks who put on uh, some amazing things. Um, this is uh, one of our newest pieces of art. Actually, there's two new pieces of art tonight on the back wall. Um, our Arts at All Souls has made this uh, beautiful, um, I think they're dried flowers that also image this new Paschal candle here. Um, and uh, on the cross here, uh, a new icon cross of the resurrection. Um, and so uh, a huge thanks goes to um, all those, our, our sound techs, our um, audio-visual texts, especially on a night like tonight, and our sacristans who work so hard, hours and hours and hours, to be here. <laughs> Lastly, uh, the staff of All Souls, who um, I'm looking at you, <laughs> uh, who have given uh, so much heart and love um, and attention and hours uh, for weeks and weeks and weeks to get to tonight. And I just want to uh, say one last word about one staff member, and that's Dent Davidson. Yeah. Uh, I, you, he's been doing this for 48 years. 48 years of lead, leading people in song and music, 
and coming to moments where God is made present and clear. And uh, at least for us in this way, this is the night. And we're so grateful for your ministry and your love and your care for us and for many, many, many others. On this night, God has acted. Jesus Christ is risen. Let us rejoice and be glad. <laughs> May God be with you. your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right in a good and joy and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. But chiefly are we bound to praise you for the glorious resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. For he is the true Paschal Lamb, who was sacrificed for us and has taken away the sin of the world. 
By his death he has destroyed death, and by his rising to life again he has won for us everlasting life. Therefore we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. It is right, holy and gracious God, in your infinite love you made us for yourself. And when we had fallen into sin and become subject to evil and death, you in your mercy sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal Son, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and maker of all. Jesus stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself in obedience to your will, a perfect sacrifice for the whole world. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, our Savior Jesus Christ took bread, and when he had given thanks to you, he broke it, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, Jesus took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ was risen. Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, Almighty God, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. Recalling Christ's death, resurrection, and ascension, we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, the holy food and drink of new and unending life in Christ. Sanctify us also that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace. And at the last day, bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forever. As our Savior Christ has taught us, we now pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, forgive us our sins. Amen. 
the gifts of God for the people of God.
Almighty and ever living God, we thank you for feeding us. A reading from the letter to Paul to the Romans. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore, we've been buried with him by baptism into death, so that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body of sin might be destroyed and we might no longer be enslaved to sin. For whoever has died is freed from sin. But if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. The death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. May Almighty God, who has redeemed us and made us her children through the resurrection of her Son, our Lord, bestow upon you the riches of her blessing. Amen. May God, who through the water of baptism has raised us from sin and to newness of life, make you holy and worthy to be united with Christ forever. Amen. May God, who has brought us out of bondage to sin and to true and lasting freedom in the Redeemer, bring you to your eternal inheritance. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you forever.
Let us go forth in the name of Christ. Alleluia. Alleluia.